All right, take 34. <laughs> My name is Blake Allard, and today I'm going to be discussing Ann Miles' article from Monster to Martyr, representing Mary Dyer. Before I talk about Mary Dyer, I want to talk about the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which she immigrated to. The colony was very intolerant. Religious leaders didn't accept any dissent, and so people like Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson were banished because they just held different ideas than the Puritans that lived there. Not only was the society very intolerant, but the society was very patriarchal and women were supposed to be subservient to men. Now that we know that, let's talk about Mary. Mary arrived to the New World with her husband, William Dyer, and their first child in 1635. And when she arrived in Massachusetts, she gained notoriety and became infamous for being an antinomian or someone who believes that God gra God's grace frees them from having to follow the law of Moses like the Puritans would. Not only was she infamous for being an antinomian and very disliked, she was infamous because of her monstrous birth. Johann Winzer, in his article Mary Dyer and the Monster Story, discusses how the Puritans tried to discredit her. He states, in the case of Mary Dyer, the motivation of her adversaries lay in their desire to discredit the antinomians, and to this end they were willing to serve as both accuser and judge, making a public spectacle of Mary's tragic birth and truly adding to the grief she and her family had already endured. Not only did Puritans try and discredit her, one famous Puritan named John Winthrop wrote on it. John Winthrop was the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he did not care for the antinomians. And it is said that on the day of Anne Hutchinson's trial, he overheard someone discussing how Mary had a child who was born like a stillborn or, or was dead, but was very deformed. And we can see in Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's article, John Winthrop, City of Women, she writes that Winthrop gleefully reported the condition of the supposed monster writing that it, it had a face but no head, and the ears stood upon the shoulders and were like an ape's. It had no forehead, but over the eyes, four horns, hard and sharp. The body had arms and legs as other children, but instead of toes, it had on each foot three claws like a young fowl with sharp talons. Does that sound true? Absolutely not, but we see that Winthrop is trying to put her in a bad light and place her in with people like Anne Hutchinson, who actually was Mary Dyer's best friend. Um, not only did he speak on Mary Dyer, but he also spoke on Anne Hutchinson saying she didn't have just one, she had 30 monsters of her own um, that did not make it. And so we can see that he's really trying to paint the antinomians or anybody who's not a Puritan as heretics who go against the Puritan church or, or whatever. So because of the embarrassment, William Dyer is disenfranchised and the family moves to Rhode Island. On a trip to England, however, um, with William, Mary becomes a Quaker. And from there, she returns to the Massachusetts Bay Colony to share her, her new news or her new religion and try and spread religious freedom. However, this is met with opposition as her and two others are arrested. The other two who are gentlemen, they get hung. And right before it's Mary's turn, they let her go because they feel bad that she's a, she's a woman and she shouldn't be punished this way. And so they send her away. The only problem is we see that while she's in Boston and she's dealing with this, according to... Johann Winsor, in his other article, Quieting Mary Dyer, Edward Burrow, and Dyer's Letter to the Massachusetts General Court, Dyer's not happy with this. And Dyer reproached the persecutors of friends, warned the court to put away their evil doings, expressed her frustration at the intervention of the magistrates who spared her life, and asserted that she came in obedience and the command of God. So we see that she is very much against what they're doing. So she is banished and she returns not once but twice. And the second time she returns, she is hung. This is um, on a, not a, not a statue, or well, yeah, a statue of her at the Massachusetts State House. 
And it says she was a witness for religious freedom and she was hung in the Boston Common in 1660. Right before she was hung, she's quoted for saying, my life not availeth me in comparison to the liberty of the truth. Um, last but not least, Anne Miles in her article from Monster to Martyr, representing Mary Dyer, is quoted saying, Dyer would have had Fox's Book of Martyrs and the similar works deeply ingrained as a pattern for understanding both her own and friend's collective experience. Nor would any member of her culture have seen the choice of martyrdom as intrinsically pathological. Whether or not she consciously strategized her end in such a literary fashion, she gained through it an enduring textual afterlife. No longer bound with an orthodoxy script as an emblem of gendered monstrosity, she would circulate among very different readers and interpreters as a faithful martyr of Jesus Christ. So we see that she goes from being a monster to a martyr for the Quaker faith. Thank you.